talk about uh, some specific aspects of the psychology of consciousness uh, today and uh, some fascinating things, particularly about how drugs use, and a couple of particular drugs that are recreational in nature and are very serious and can cause some damage uh, and can cause some real, real troubles. We're going to take a look at ecstasy and oddly enough its relationship to Prozac, an antidepressant. And then we're also going to look at cocaine. We're going to physically look at how these work on the system. And the way I'd like to do this is to start out with the structure of the neuron. So if we look at the neuron, we have a, an interesting structure. And I'll show you a picture of it up here. All this artwork, by the way, is courtesy of Brooks Cole Publishers. And if you see the neuron here, you've got um, the dendrites coming out from this end. Dendrites will come up time and time again because, in fact, ecstasy has some profound effect on those in the long run. There's the cell body where all the work is done of the cell. Then you've got this long axon. And this particular axon, which has all kinds of branches that connect more or less with the next neurons, with a gap in between, is covered by a myelin sheath. And that myelin sheath acts as an insulator and it speeds up the transmission in the neurons that have it. A lot of brain disorders are uh, brain disorders of this myelin sheath breaking down, by the way. Um, <clears throat> now, if we look at this structure, the information always flows from the dendrites through the cell body through uh, to the axon to a synapse. And a synapse uh, would be where one axon connects with a dendrite of the next neuron. So within a neuron, it's dendrite, cell body, axon. Between neurons, of course, at the one end, we've got axon. And then notice that they don't connect. There's a space. And we're going to enlarge that space quite dramatically and talk about how things work. So if you have information flowing down a neuron, the action potential that you probably read about in the book. You've got information flowing down here. It ruptures a series of vesicles. And these vesicles have all kinds of chemicals inside of them, neural transmitters. And these neural transmitters are then put out into the synaptic space, the synaptic cleft. So this area here is called the synapse, S-Y-N-A-P-S-E, synapse. Now what happens here is that these molecules seem to have, phys I mean, they have physical structure, and then there are receptors that have a parallel physical structure on the other side. So for the next neuron to fire, these little neurotransmitters need to trigger, fit right in like a key and a lock into that uh, next neuron. Now let's focus on this particular chart over here, because that'll show it a little bit more clearly. And again, what we're talking about here is the synapse. And in this particular case, you see these vesicles. Can you see those pretty closely? And all the little um, neurotransmitters inside. And when a, a action potential comes down and zaps these vesicles, they dump the neurotransmitters into the, the synapse. And so the, the neurotransmitters then either fit across into like a key, like a lock. They, they're like a key into a lock and cause the next neuron to fire, or they don't. Or they cause the next neuron to slow down. In fact, most of the, the internal pharmaceuticals that our body produces inhibit our behavior. So that's rather interesting. Now, let's take a look a little bit closer on this third uh, sign here, this third example. And you've got the same thing, just a little closer up. And so you've got the action potential coming down the axon. You've got the synapse, where all the neurotransmitters are dumped out, and in, in this Inside the cell, you have the synthesis and storage of these. Number two, you have the release of the neurotransmitters. Number three, binding of the neurotransmitter into the next neuron. Number four, inactivation or removal of the neurotransmitters. And then five, the reuptake and then therefore the remanufacture. So there's a cycle going on here. Now that's kind of the background. Now let's take a look at ecstasy. What are the effects of ecstasy? Well, people get incredibly thirsty. In fact, some of the deaths that have occurred have occurred because of dehydration. Heart races, you really feel like you've got all kinds of energy. There's a great euphoria. People just feel great. They feel wonderful at the time that the ecstasy is working in that way. They don't feel so wonderful a day or two, oftentimes. In fact, most often. Uh, there's often a repetitive sucking motion. You may have noticed that some people use ecstasy. Uh, we'll use even like a baby nibble to kind of suck on. 
and that has to do with the serotonin system being a muscular control system as well as a, a, an energy level system and things of that nature. And uh, actually it's an energy, energy control system. And um, if you look at ecstasy, then after the person has this wild amount of energy, they dance all night, they have a great time, they just feel euphoric, they feel wonderful, they get extremely thirsty, then we've got something called Suicide Tuesday. And that's a little over dramatic perhaps, but there's this huge crash for lots of people. Well, what has happened there? Serotonin works in the following manner. Uh, I mean, ecstasy works in the following manner. There is a neurotransmitter called serotonin that is really the workhorse of the nervous system, S-E-R-O-T-O-N-I-N. And it's involved in uh, all kinds of things. It seems to be implicated in depression, and it seems to be indicated into energy regulation. In fact, it may have evolved as a chemical that slows us down in the winter or, or during a dry season when we evolved that will save energy. And therefore, we naturally feel a little more depressed in the winter and things of that nature. Well, the way ecstasy works is it dumps a whole bunch of serotonin into the synapse all at once. So the serotonin that keeps us feeling good, keeps us out of depression, is dumped there and we not only just feel good, we feel wonderful. We feel incredibly euphoric. We get really excited. We just can't, can't seem to hold ourselves down. Ideas are flying a mile a minute. And then it also does something else. So number one, it dumps massive amounts of serotonin into the system. And you know the system has limited amounts of serotonin, of course. And the second thing it does is it blocks the reuptake. It, in this picture, remember there was a reuptake where they went in number five? It blocks the reuptake of serotonin back into the system, so more isn't being manufactured as fast as you might need it the next day. So when you start crashing off of ecstasy, or E as they often call it, is uh, a depression extremely common. So it gets you going up really fast by dump, dumping lots of serotonin into the system and then you crash because it's uh, minimized the amount of serotonin that is now available the next day because you've used so much. Now how does this relate to Prozac? If we look at Prozac, it's an antidepressant that works remarkably in some people, at least for the first three months. There's a number of people after about the first three months it stops working or they have to have their dosage or change to another drug. And there's some real detailed reasons why that probably is. But Prozac does a similar thing. It increases serotonin slowly at the synapse. So see the relationship between the two? They're both increasing serotonin at the synapse Prozac works gradually and usually takes two, three, four weeks to kick in, and uh, uh, ecstasy kicks in almost just within a matter of an hour. It just starts kicking in and dumps all kinds of serotonin and blocks the reuptake. So here are two chemicals that are fairly sim similar. Notice the change in the consciousness we experience is really the change in chemical changes at the synapse and the effects it has upon the body. Now let's look fairly quickly at a, a, a third drug, and that's cocaine. Also an extremely dangerous drug. Freud uh, played around with a great deal. He used a fair amount, but he used it periodically. Didn't appear to get addicted to it, but um, he was sending it to his uh, it, woman he was engaged to to try to perk her up and all that kind of stuff. And it worked for him. He tried to use this as a miracle drug. Unfortunately, one of his patients who was a friend um, died of an overdose of cocaine as a result of a, or died of a fatal addiction of cocaine rather. And so there obviously is all kinds of problems. How does cocaine work? Well, cocaine works at the same level, actually it works at two different levels here. If we have information being put out here, little neurotransmitters are being put out trying to be accepted by the next neuron, cocaine blocks a chemical, a set of chemicals called catecholamines. Catecholamines. And in effect what it does is speed up transmission from one neuron to the other so people are moving faster, they feel like the ideas are flowing, they again feel euphoria. But it also does something else interesting. You notice I have a rather large nose here. Let me get real close to the camera so you can see that rather large nose. Uh, <clears throat> I had uh, it broken several times in football and probably opening my mouth when I shouldn't have been opening my mouth. And I had to eventually have an operation to get the septum straightened out so I could breathe. 
And when they did that operation, they packed my nose membranes with cocaine. It happens to be the drug of choice for operations on the nose and the eyes. And oddly enough, why would that be? If it speeds everything up, if it makes you want to move faster, that would be the opposite of what you need to do in an operation, right? Well, it has a second effect. Make sure we can see this one up here. If we look back again at the general structure of the neuron, just drawing the, the dendrites, the cell body, the axon with its myelian sheath around it, and the axon terminals, the synapse. Uh, if you look at it, cocaine applied directly here blocks and interferes with, since BLOCK blocks, um, the action potential. So on one hand, it speeds up transmission, but when applied directly to tissue, like the nose or the eye or something else, it literally stops the electrical firing. So it works as a wonderful anesthetic, paradoxically. So when we look at changes in consciousness, there's certainly a lot we don't know. But we do know that some changes in consciousness are really the result of changes in chemicals that occur at the synaptic level and in the neurons themselves. Okay? Thank you very much.